Hey, you dudes. Guess what I'm doing today. I'm probably going to work on Skull. What did I have to do? Oh, I need to... Uh, let's see, do... Do all the integration of the quills. That's what I was working on when last we met. And let's see, since I crashed, I need to reload all my cool stuff, which means I need to remember where it is. I think. I think. I put the scales. No, I didn't put the scales in Scola. That's right. I keep meaning to, and then I keep not doing it. Under scales, Scola. I want to say it was two. Yes. case here. Yeah, easiest solution. Just move it up. It's fine. They are purposefully organically unevenly placed. Uh, let's see. The other thing I needed to do was I was trying to figure out how to use this point system for the last 20 minutes and being really frustrated. Uh, I need to put this over here. Now, I did adjust a setting that hopefully, uh, hopefully gets noticed and acted upon. Come on, you could, you could do it. Oh, man. Sometimes, sometimes I just can't grab the things I'm trying to grab, and that is that is sad times. And I I don't know why. Okay, I guess that window will be just be squashed up there in the corner. That's fine. Uh, okay, so. What you guys should notice is that literally, I set it to every minute, it's not going to be like this forever, but for right now, every minute, this little lion head should pop up. And if you click on it, you should get 10 hearts. Please tell me if that works for anyone at any time. Sigma 3030, thank you. I did spend a lot of time on the detail. I'm glad it shows. Okay, I think that quill will work. This quill is still ugly. What if I move that one up as well? Mwahaha. I could use the move tool, kind of squash it to get it to conform to the surface even more better. You spend months on your uh, sculpts. Do you do a uh, ZBrush as well? I've used ZBrush for many, many, many years, but 
I don't use it often enough to actually be like really good at it. Getting there slowly but surely. I still find myself doing long drawn out stupid ways of uh, doing things. Simply because I don't I don't know better yet how to accomplish things the fast and easy way. Four plus years detail guy yeah I'm a I call it being a texture hound I just I love textures and working on them and so I always have to resist the temptation to jump right into the details right off the bat I need to constantly remind myself no no go back make sure you have the fundamentals the proportions the, the pose, the attitude, like all those things, because otherwise I'm just going to end up having to redo all that detail later anyway. Embedded all these little quills as separate sub-objects, and now I'm going in and making the skin actually look like they're, you know, part of the thing rather than just objects dangling off of it. Because I'm going to be 3D printing him, I'm paying special attention to not making super thin little bits. Like these, uh, these whiskers are as thin as I want it to go, and I have a feeling they're going to be problematic for me. But these quills have the potential to be even thinner, which I do not want. Hey, Letha. You make game models and have made 3D prints for people. Cool. Uh, I've only done 3D printing through uh, Shapeways. I haven't done any myself. I recently got a 3D printer, but I have not yet um, gone through the process of actually running anything through it. I'm waiting for a friend who's more technically inclined than me to come over and hold my hand. You 3D print, model rig, animate, and program. Wow, you do all the things, don't you? You true polymath. I'm super bad with technical stuff, so I do not stand a chance at, um, at programming. I said, uh, I recently moved in my career from uh, art to design, even though I mean, I've been doing design my whole career, but it was never my official title. And so I'm having to learn a bunch of more technical stuff when it comes to scripts and the like. And boy, that is not fun.
Lolita says, I need Michelle to hold my hand through making a regular printer work. Fair. Yeah. how these quills would kind of tug and pull at the skin as it sags around them. Sigma says, one guy wanting to make a game, so I have to learn it all. I learned C++, C++ and then everything else from there. Wow, very impressive. Uh, why don't you just use a free tool set like Unreal or um, Unity that has all that like scripting and assets and stuff you can work with. It's not the same as making something from scratch, granted, but if you're just getting started, it seems like pretty good training wheels. But then some people don't want training wheels. I want to say they did something all by their big boy selves from the start. I gotta respect that. You use Unreal, but rather C++ because I can super customize stuff. Yeah, it's really neat how their blueprint system lets you, uh, like, decompiles their blueprints into C++ and vice versa. Not something I could ever take advantage of, but it's cool that other people Yeah, that's how a lot of developers get their start, is making hacks for games. That and uh, mods and that sort of thing. I wish I was smart enough to do that. Got all sorts of little game ideas that I plan to do someday, but I gotta get these books done first. do this extra wrinkle stuff all over. Let me just double check that my scale application process is going to work for me. A little bit bigger, a little less, a little less intense. 76, hello, welcome. the flow to come out a little bit less. Uh, turn the intensity up. Okay, it still needs to come out less. Can get the flow down to 0 0.05. That's more like it. Still use some intensity. Chance. Okay, that might be a little... Oh, okay, so it's at point zero 0.01. Let's... Ah, come on. Let me change... What? I can't type a number in here? Are you kidding me? Point zero 0.08. That's a little better. Make it a little bigger. 
bigger. There we go. That's starting to blend well. Sigma says, I need to get a team together that's willing to work on a game and accept getting paid if we succeed Kickstarter. Yeah, that's tricky. Getting people to work for not pay. It's usually where you get, like, students and stuff. No, that was, that's actually the single biggest kind of blocker for me making my games is... Like, if you want to do it right, you need to have contracts that everyone signs, um, and, like, think through the process and have all those negotiations, but all that stuff is just super expensive to do. Like, my attitude is, I would just split everything exactly proportional by how many people are on the team uh, but can can you, you just trust me so we don't have to do contracts I'll do it all right but that's that's not something that you should expect people to uh, agree to or believe unless they know you really well and even then, I mean, going into business with friends is, and, you know, friends, family, anyone you have a previous relationship with, it's, that's a risky thing to do. That's why you're not going into business with me. Yeah, that's why I'm not going into business with Heather. I just totally ran into the door and that really hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I'm also not going into business with you because you run into doors. <laughs> and a liability. Yeah the chance of a, of a workers comp lawsuit from you is too high. good at bruising. Alita says hi. Hey. Um, my foot, how it's hurting so bad. Mm -hmm. I, you know how yesterday when I was rubbing it and it snapped and I got all pushed out? Yeah. Uh, Laura said that I probably, I had subluxed it and I pushed the metal car so whatever one that one is. It's Metamucil. Yep, Metamucil. Back in. That sounds uncomfortable. Yeah, that's why I thought, but why it was like really gross. Although, it hurt, but it was more gross than it was hurting your feet. Yeah. I'm concerned that I'm ruining the general... I'm just going to the neighborhood. Okay. Sorry that I'm ruining the general flow and the perceived, like I was, I was working so hard to get this kind of um, bird cage, rib cage for him. So when he, when he inflates, uh, you get that, that sense of understructure and then sucks back in. And when they breathe, you can kind of see the, the between the uh, rib bones inflate and deflate slightly. I don't know if this is mucking with that or not, but I do know it's like down on this level, I think it uh, it works really well. Get that little bit of a belly button hump over them. It makes them feel very grounded. So I'm just going to keep doing it. And you know what? Once I... Uh, once I'm rich and famous, I'll hire a better artist to come in and like 
make it exactly perfect. Letha says, an author friend, Heidi, visited today. Her kids got to ride Sonomi, and then we hung out with your mom. Nice. Sigma says, over a minute, no lion? Uh, well, there, there should be a lion. I see one on my Twitch stream uh, from 20 seconds ago. For anyone who missed it, I set up a system where you should be able to like uh, I'll, this piece of art, where'd it go? This, this lion head here should appear once a minute. And if you click it or tap it on your screen, you should get 10 hearts. That is assuming I set it up and it's actually running. I, I don't know how to actually confirm or deny that that's actually happening. Yeah, so so anyway, everyone keep on a lookout for that lion head. And if you see one, click it and let me know what happens. So I have no idea. I've never been on the other end of it either. I've never been on a stream that has those things appear or, you know, that I've noticed. But you should also all be receiving a, um, a heart every minute that you're on the stream. Actually, uh, let's see, where would it show that? Um, where's the picture of that? Okay, so this is the thing I'm trying to do is this loyalty points, blah, blah, blah. It's got a bunch of other features I don't care about, but there's supposed to be a little stream menu that hides when it's not used. Uh, I don't see it on my stream, I don't think. I see the little thingy for, um, donating bits and for smileys what, what does this do live emotes no I don't want that uh, streamlabs tools oh I wonder if it's something I wonder if I have to set it up as a as a layer or whatever in streamlabs I'll bet that's what I have to do you know what eh, let's do that now see if we can do that okay so in theory I do an add uh, it is a widget of some sort uh, let's see sponsor credits viewer camp donation goal donation ticker the jar follower goal spin wheel stream boss bit goal chat box stream okay I don't see it in there Mm. All right. Looks like I'm going to have to do more research. <sighs> Yet again. his chin which means he's gonna have he's gonna have a jawbone that goes down which means the skin is probably a little a little closer to it 
rubber skin is close to the bone, it's not going to have as much um, sag to it usually. I mean, this is his jowls, so they're sagging down here, but like anywhere close to the bone. I think that's a general rule that I've observed in nature. I could be wrong. skin flap. I can see this being kind of a flow. do something. And the whole time I've been working on this guy, I've been, when I, when I need to like get into an armpit or whatever, right? What I've been in the habit of doing is you drag this box out by holding shift and control. Let's see, if you can, uh, let's see shift control alt will then make it an opposite of that. And you can cut it off and then you can go in and do this. But if it's something you're going to be doing a lot, which uh, I should be doing more often, uh, what you can do is make a mask, for instance. Uh, I'm going to use a lasso, please. Okay. Nope. Not like that. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, shoot. I just told it to Dynamesh.
Are we back? Did we do it? That was amazing. I love that mistake. Yep, because I did a super processor intense operation on Mr. Scola here. I wonder if it actually wrecked him or not. So I'm pretty sure I just need to undo it. Yeah. Control Z. So stupid. <sighs> okay. Now. I need to make this be a mask lasso. Here we go. Boom. I think I got a little bit of his side here. Okay. Now, with this arm selected, actually I might as well select the other one too. Yeah, it was pretty suspenseful. For sure. I like to keep people on the edges of their seats and saddles. Uh, your friend with the kids who rode your horses, Aletha, I assumed that was um, H.L. Burke. Is that she's the author that you keep telling me I should read because she's great? Poly groups, here we go. Okay. So as you can see, he is all one poly group, all one shade of green. But I can group masked. Boom. And now uh oh, now he has these different colors. So all I gotta do is poke him. Wait, what is happening? All I do is poke him. Nope. What is even happening? Something bad. Uh, is this the problem? Poke. There we go. Okay. Poke his body and because that's one poly group, that's all that remains. So I can easily work on just the arms or just the body. Yay! That wasn't so hard, was it? It was a little hard. She just posted a brief hello video of a tiny mini interview with you. And she got one of your mom too. Awesome! What kind of uh, what kind of work does she do? Is it YA fantasy stuff or Sculptress mode when part of the mesh is hidden. Well, that's no fun. She writes fantasy steampunk, or maybe it's gas lamp. In the middle. Alright. Speaking of writing, I almost finished uh, getting in uh, all the revisions based on your feedback to my to those two chapters I sent you. I'm agreeing with and following, I'd say, 85% of your feedback. I'm really torn, actually, on the 
what you call uh, 50 cent words versus 5 cent words. It's hard for me because I was raised by this woman named uh, Leela Rose Foreman, who is a sesquipedalian, and that rubbed off on me. So it's like it's hard for me to say that's a big fancy word. It's good to get feedback from non sesquipedalians to say, "Hey, this word is big and threw me out of." the flow that I was in but then I I also have this like weird resistance to that where I'm like no I want I want people to be somewhat challenged by this work and to grow as individuals as a result of that now that's stupid because Having a big vocabulary is not character growth. Having a big vocabulary, in fact, often is the opposite and just makes you a pedant and obnoxious to those around you. So I need to just, I just need to suck it up and be like, you know what, you're right. There's a specific word, maybe settle for 30 cent words. <laughs> It's good to compromise. Like, so, so here's an interesting edge case for you. One of, one of the words that you called out was um, uh, refraction. Uh, and you were like, replace it with reflection. Because I've got these like crystalline bubble rooms that are like stuck together. Like these are natural growths that, that occur in this um, this alien mushroom thing that, that the protagonists are trapped in. And uh, what they are technically doing, like, because I, I see this in my mind very clearly, I know exactly how I would uh, render it, I, I, you know, or illustrate it or whatever, what it's going to look like in the movie. Um, and what they are doing is refracting light and images which is not the same thing as reflecting. However, it's very close to the same thing. And furthermore, so here's, here's like a rule I'm proposing. If it's close enough where when people read it, they're gonna guess that it's the closest word to it that they know, they're not going to be wrong, very wrong. They might be a little bit wrong, but people who do know the word are going to understand my vision of it better. The question is, did I, did I throw away potential readers because there are people who are going to be annoyed that they feel like, what, does this author want me to just keep going to the dictionary over and over? Um, and just because I find that a fun thing, that doesn't mean other people do. Like, actually, I was, uh, yeah, it was in that chapter I was reading. My mom used the word, um, something about a slope declining. I can't remember what the word was, but it, I had never heard the word before. And I thought it probably was some variant of, you know, to decline. And indeed, that's exactly what it was. But it was a, a 50 cent word. Um, but I liked looking it up. However, looking up a word is a very different mental state than being in the flow of reading a story and caring about what's happening to these characters. Mostly what I'm doing is, is talking my way over to, over to your um, advice, Aletha. I often need to talk myself into the right decisions. You know?
Aletha says, I was thinking for flow purposes and for mass appeal. I don't mind looking up a word or two myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mass appeal. Do I want mass appeal? I've said this before, which is that I'm not looking for mass appeal with my work. But that needs to be considered on a, on a spectrum. I also don't want 0.0000001% of the population to appreciate uh, my work and no one else, right? There's, there's, a, there's a middle ground there that ought to be aimed for. The example that I used, I was interviewed on a podcast, on a, the Yeah Dude Gamers podcast. And that's something that, you know, a topic they were talking about was like, how broad appeal do you, you know, are you trying to be? And, you know, my response to that was, I'm looking for special people who have particular sensibilities. They're going to be smarter than average. They're going to be more curious than average. Um, but is, but is there... Do I want to necessarily exclude people with a conscious decision that, you know, no, I want to be elitist about this? And that's not the case. That's not my heart at all. Um, what I was specifically responding to was like, how do you balance how much of your own art you're doing as opposed to other uh, other IPs? Like, I could get, I could probably make my channel blow up if I was doing you know, uh, fanfic type stuff, like, I'm gonna make Harry Potter and Hermione make and love pictures, or I'm gonna make Iron Man sculptures, or I'm gonna make furry versions of Captain America, you know, like, all, those kind of things will draw order of magnitude more people than, hey, watch me doodle on my own little thing that you guys have never heard of, right? Alita says, I have to talk myself through stuff like that, too. And certainly, keep some of the words. Just not so many. So close together, I think. I was thinking mass appeal, like, on the level of Star Wars, as you want your empire to be. Yeah, so that is a thing. Like, I, I have also said many times, I want to make the next Star Wars universe that is as popular as Star Wars. That That is a goal of mine. Um, in order to achieve that goal, I need to appeal to... Uh, not the masses, but a, a good chunk of that, of those masses, right? Like, there's always going to be more people who watch sports than who care about Star Wars, or who watch, you know, the Cardassians or whatever. Cardassians? Car oh, Cardassians are the, are the Star Trek guys. Um... Yeah, so it's an uh, it's interesting balance, but I think I've talked myself into agreeing with you that we should, we should excise the unnecessarily uh, obtuse words and replace them with simple ones. Especially given that we're dealing with a fantasy context. There's already a lot to, to mentally digest when you're reading our books that already interrupt flow. I think flow is like the main currency. If it's not the main one, it's, it's definitely a big one. Like you want your readers engaged and just like chugging along and like excited to see what's in the next sentence, what's in the next paragraph, what's in the next chapter. And the more they're pulled out of that by stupid things like words they don't understand, uh, the worse that is for everyone. I, I hope to educate people's souls and hearts, not their brains. I like educating brains, but that's not the, that's not what's going to make the world a better place, ultimately. 
You could have a world full of very smart, very evil people. many amazing things in your books um i think so yeah i mean that's why i mean i've been world building that darn world for 20 years there better be a lot of amazing things in there it'd be pretty disappointing if there weren't uh, i've made changes in my writing in order to get better flow yeah um i mean yeah actually a, a lot of the advice that that you've given me, especially about passive words versus active words and stuff. It's all stuff that I've heard before many times, but, uh, I, I forget. I can't, I can't remember every piece of writing advice I've read and heard all the time. So you need reminders and you need feedback and stuff like yours, which is super valuable and I super appreciate it. Oh, another thing I wanted to try to talk myself out of today was um, something I, I posted about on Twitter and uh, that other place, Facebook, was like, I, I feel like I need to... This is something I don't want to do, but I feel like I need to change the measurements to metric um, for two reasons. And when I say them out loud, they're going to sound super stupid, and then I'll be like, oh, why am I doing this? This is super stupid. Um, a, the story takes place on a world that is populated with humans who have, um, who are from our future. Um, So the, the old imperial system that we uh, stupid people in the U.S. still use for stupid reasons, um, it's not going to stay. It's going to go away. It has to. It's ridiculous. It's such a vestige of the past. It's ridiculous. So for, like, realism purposes and for, like, the reason that I'm wanting to do fantasy instead of sci-fi is because I think fantasy lasts longer and I want to have a lasting impact on the world with these stories and because sci-fi becomes laughable in 10 20 30 years as technology advances there are you know when you watch Star Trek and they don't have any conception of the internet and you're like uh, this is weird that sort of thing, it just, yeah, it's awful. So, so I, I, I want to make this fantasy, but there is inevitable sci-fi-ness to it in, the, in kind of the setup that we've created about these future humans who, are, who have been uh, planted on this Earth-like planet with all these other alien races, uh, but they don't have sci-fi tech. They, well, they do have some, but it's never explained in detail, again, wanting to avoid the stuff that makes sci-fi not last long and uh yeah so anyway because because the the metric system is going to be what any future spacefarers are using uh it would be weird to have these humans from the future uh be using an old imperial system from an old planet that they don't remember anymore uh so So it makes me feel like I have to, have to use metric. The other reason is because m most of the world, except for the U.S. and a couple other dumb countries, uh, all use metric. And it's alienating to them to be hearing units that 
they don't that they don't use on a regular basis. Uh, and it was interesting hearing from people from other parts of the world say like, I don't know what a foot is. Like, how long is a foot? Um, and it's so pervasive in, in media, all of, you know, obviously Hollywood is the main cultural export and in the vast majority of Hollywood movies, when units are ever mentioned, they're pretty much, they're pretty much imperial, feet and yards and uh, miles. But then the problem is, I don't speak metric myself, so I'm struggling with the translation, and I know, you know, all of my friends and colleagues. <laughs> are in the United States and it's going to be alienating to them to have to think. Meters, I think, I think most Americans know that a meter is about three feet. I could be totally wrong about that. Again, like, there's all sorts of words that I assume everyone knows that, that they don't. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know. Letha says, that's one I have to wrap my mind around, too. I grumble at the idea of changing it to metric, but I think it's ultimately a good idea. Yeah, it, it's just such an incredible waste of time. The, the fact that Americans, well, United States Americans still use this ridiculous system. It's almost angering to me. So the, the third option, so option one is keep it as is with with uh, imperial measurements and just say whatever, hand wave it, you know, maybe in translations in other countries, you know, the British version can have, although it seems like all of the, uh, all of the British people that I know that, that gave feedback and Australian, well, not all the Australian, all the British though were perfectly fine using feet and inches. Um, Australian, I, I think, I think I heard from two Australian people and I think one of them was like, yeah, I'm not quite sh comfortable with, with feet and inches. I don't really know what they, what they are exactly. I mean, they knew what they were. They don't just automatically translate it in, in their heads to them. That's, and so, yeah, maybe for those particular markets, we can pay an editor to go in and swap all those out. And then the third option is just use um, metaphorical distances, you know, a walk length, a jump height, a, a span, uh, a... and that gets tricky and messy and weird. And I don't like messy, weird things. fourth option is to use complete fantasy names that you just make up and I, I don't read enough to know what standard practice is to be honest I'm trying like the, the biggest fantasy stuff I've been reading lately is the is the stormlight archives and I cannot think of how he uses measurement. This is probably something that exists. Uh, a, 
a website or something that tracks this kind of stuff. I think switching it up with some metaphorical ones is good. Yeah. And certainly people from different cultures are going to think uh, units differently. You know, if you're not from a very technical society, like Bo Bomark is from a uh, kind of an islander society where they're not making you know, gears and cogs and mechanical devices. Um, which I think drives most of that precision language around units. Um, whereas Megaloth, the, the big capital that he visits, uh, they're, they're very, they're um, uh, Renaissance level advanced. Uh, so they've got closer to clockwork kind of stuff. And so they would need very precise measurements for, you know, centimeters and millimeters and stuff. And so maybe that solves that problem in that because Beaumark is the tight third person protagonist, he could always be speaking in the more generalist Islander terms. And then when characters who are from the Megaloth Empire speak, they would speak in... Um, they would be speaking in more precise terms, uh, which helps this book. It does not help all the other books that are not from the point of view of an Islander. What's going on? Select me. There we go. Uh, a lot of the other books are from people who live in or around Megaloth City and would be Megalothy. Why is this having such trouble selecting this whole thing? There we go. You've used feet and inches because you're a lazy bum. Do you know any uh, readers who are from other countries who, have, who would give feedback on that sort of thing? Yeah, I think I just need to do more research before I make a decision like this. More research is almost always a good idea, especially before making drastic decisions that are going to take a lot of time and effort. I mean, I did a lot of research on my language idea and changed my mind because of that, and I'm glad I did.
Aletha, you called out the cave shroom um, chapters as kind of the most problematic to you. Do you remember what uh, what was next on your list as far as the chapters that just ended up being fatiguing and not fun because they were they were too hard? So I'd like to I'd like to kind of tackle them in that order. Uh, when I was in New Zealand, we were buying ham, and we needed a pound, but their measurements were in grams, and none of us knew how to convert. Not the gal working there either, but Google knew the answer. <laughs> yeah. That is, that is vexing. I have no idea what a gram is either. I know, I know from figuring out uh, macronutrients for my food that it's much smaller than an ounce, but I... I couldn't tell you how much. Uh, no, 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 don't, don't do Take a nap while I wait. Are we done? Oh, we did it. Okay. Excellent. That is, I, I wish there was an option to make that not be a button. Um, well, actually, if I just click this Dynamesh button, I think that solves the problem. Let me do that on here too. Dynamesh button. Okay. I think that will keep that obnoxious thing from happening again. Okay, so what I was trying to do was mask all of these. Yeah, there's some combination of keys. In ZBrush, it's always like a combination of three or four keys that you have to press. I was doing a thing that I was really happy, and then, you know, at some point, the muscle memory goes away, and I can't remember what the particular combination is, and I do the wrong thing, and then it does something completely unexpected that I did not want. And that is ZBrush in a nutshell. Chase scene where Beaumark flees the place with the magic orb. Uh, you mean the the stone? Where he steals the stone from uh, the Megaloth Empire? And he's like climbing up the outside of the building and running around on gear, moving gears and stuff. That would be my guess because, again, I was writing a script for an action scene, like as though I could give these directions to a, a, uh, a director, a film director, and he would know exactly like where to put the camera, all the moves that were blah, 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 right? I've just been telling Michelle how that happened to you earlier, and we got freeze frames of dramatic poses, and then it happened again, right after I was demonstrated. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing else I could do at that point except be, be overly dramatic about it. Okay, so you select this. Uh, control shift. Uh, that does something, but not what I wanted. 
uh, control. No. Nope. Oh, right. I need to be in move mode. Okay. Now is it control click? Control click when you're in uh, trans transform mode. Okay. Yes, it will be spectacular in a movie, but uh, what I need to do is save that scene as it is. And so when I develop the movie, I can refer to that, but then make a novel version of that, which is not move by move by move. Um, yeah, actually, you called it out really well, uh, Alifa, when you said, anytime you say the staff did this and then that, that's when you know you're, you're doing it wrong. The other thing I kept doing is referencing the left or right hand or leg, or because because again, I'm I'm in my mind I can see him doing these very specific, very clever things, and that's the thing, like that's what I want to communicate is how like physically clever he is, right? And again, he's gonna look like Jackie Chan in the in the movie, uh, and it's gonna be just awe-inspiring to watch him act but yeah reading a Jackie Chan action scene would be terrible and that's what I need to keep telling myself don't write Jackie Chan action scenes uh, the, the the trick in my mind the, the thing that makes it difficult for me I have no problem wiping everything out and starting over in those scenes. No problem with that. Um, my problem comes in not wanting to lose um, the valuable uh, artistry of the scene that will be in in the movie. And uh, and the so so saving the document as it is right now solves that problem the the problem in the year or problem is then writing the scene again to work well in a novel in a way that contradicts what uh what would be in the in the movie that's the tricky part to me because one of my core pillars of of developing this whole ip is that the book and the movie and the comic and the the game, none of those things are going to contradict each other. And this is just one of those logistical uh, hurdles I'm having to I'm having to innovate on to figure out, okay, how is that actually going to work in, in action? It's, it's simple to say in principle, uh, it's much harder to do in, in the actual uh, procedure. Hey Sigrid says, even though we in uh, Denmark use other measurement, I think most are like me. When we read where other measurements are used, you quickly imagine different. Okay. Uh, do you do you notice when uh, you're reading or watching a movie or TV from the U.S. Uh, do you have to like stop and think through when they say it it was five feet away or look at that four foot tall woman you know what i mean like are you having to does it does it kick you out of the flow that's the question i guess that's important to me uh, letha says the book can more gloss over scenes and in the movies they'll be more visually detailed and still the same or something along those lines yeah that's what i'm hoping to accomplish it's it's finding that balance of like not not leaving out things that are significant to Beaumark and the character and like things that would flow from. Like ideally things in the plot don't happen just for their own sake. They happen because they have a meaningful impact on the character and you know his predicament, what he has to do as a result of those things. Um, not that I always accomplish that, but that is the ideal.
Sigrid. It does not break your flow because it's used often. Okay, that's, that's good to know. And you're from Denmark. Okay. Yeah, um... How many, how many languages do you speak? Or are you fluent enough in? I'm always so envious of people from, from um, Europe because inevitably they know two or three or four languages. It's like that is one of my, I think my biggest flaws as a human being, is being monolingual. It makes me feel like such a moron. But at least I'm very good with my English. I do my good English well. Jep? That is not an answer, Sigrid. Jep is not the number I'm looking for. How many languages do you speak? Or are you just saying, yep, to me being a moron? If that's the case, then I agree with you. Inglex Ogtaisk. Was that perfect pronunciation or what? English and Deutsch. All right. I'm also incredibly stupid and ignorant when it comes to uh, what the Scandinavian countries are and how they differ from uh, the countries around them. Like, I honestly can't tell you if Denmark is a Scandinavian country or not. I know, I know geographically it's located right next to them. But I have, I have offended people on more than one occasion when I've referred to them as Scandinavian or a game as Scandinavian or whatever. And it's like, no, it's from Denmark, you idiot. It's totally different. Janae met a Japanese celebrity today. Oh, yeah? What, what, are, they, what are they famous for? And I thought she was trapped on like a tiny rural island. I didn't know there were Japanese celebrities would be around there. should have uh, <laughs> really should have done this sculpting of the of this I can never remember the word for these things it starts with a Q it's not quail quill boy yeah after uh, I should have done this sculpting after I put the quills in but I did all this detail work uh, just assuming the quills would fit in there just fine but no, they, they need to be married into the surface. Uh, Denmark is also Scandinavia. It is? 
who was yelling at me for saying something from their country was Scandinavian. So Scandinavia, if I understand it, Denmark kind of pokes up into the sea there. And then there's like, north of that is Finland. And then like on the, on the west coast of that is Sweden, right? Um, and then you have the various kind of, uh, 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 what is it called? Um, there's a word for those Eastern European countries. Are they Baltic? It's the Baltic Sea. I'm so dumb. I'm so dumb, you guys. The land of the Vikings. That's right. Uh, Letha said they had an event there. Plus a TV channel interviewed her and other people in the jet program. Oh, cool. She got to be on the TV. People still watch TV in Japan. I don't know many people who watch TV here in the U.S. anymore. stop being stupid for a quick second. I'm just going to look this up. Scandinavia. Here we go. Region in Europe. Scandinavia. Uh, do, 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 do. Majority national languages in the region. All right, let's just go to the Wikipedia. They have strong historical, cultural, and linguistic ties. Although, I keep hearing that they always argue that they're very distinct. Um, probably like siblings, you know, they, they want to be their own person. Uh, they're mutually intelligible North Germanic languages. Okay, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Oh, I said Finland. Okay, so Finland is not in there. Good to know. Maybe that's what I got wrong before. Uh, in English use, usage, the term also refers to the Scandinavian Peninsula or to the broader region, including Finland and Iceland. Okay, that's where I'm getting mixed up then. Uh, which is always known locally as the Nordic countries. Okay, so Scandinavia is a subset of Nordic. I won't remember that, but I'm going to try. Uh, well, the part of the Nordic countries, the remote Norwegian islands of Svalbard and Jan Mayan are not in Scandinavian, nor is Greenland, a constituent country within the Kingdom of Denmark. Oh, that's right. Greenland is technically part of Denmark. Okay. So, so, okay. So Finland is Nordic, but not necessarily Scandinavian. All right, Janae says he's famous for traditional Enka singing and really good at Ked Kendama, but I don't know what those are. Miyama Hiroshi. Let's find out, shall we? Oh, look at that cutie pie. Let's see what he has to say for himself. Okay, here we are in Japan. Okay, here he is walking around. Good. Oh, here he is singing. Sounds very traditional. All right, now we know. I would consider that traditional Japanese singing. So it'd be like the equivalent of opera for us, maybe. Is 
It's definitely not J-pop. At least that piece wasn't. Oh, you can't hear them? Oh, right, I should. I needed to turn up the volume on the thingy thing. Well, you can Google him just as well yourself. It's interesting, I was kind of struggling to, to find a way to get the skin nice and saggy uh, between his, his rib bones, but it turns out these are great little anchors to really communicate that sagginess, so I didn't need to worry myself. Uh, can you guys hear any music, for that matter? That's no, that's fine. Uh, I was going to say you could turn on the AC if you need it. We've got, we've got crazy, polluted, smoky air imported from Canada right now. It's uh, officially in the red danger zone. You're not supposed to take your pets out outside or do heavy physical activity outside right now. Magic Penguin, how's it going? Yeah, I've got a big, a big list of um, just YouTube generic music. Some of it is quite nice. I've had to had to go in and delete because they were not so nice. That's good art and chill music, isn't it? I see a little treasure chest on my screen. You guys don't see it like right around here. have to set something up in there that I 
haven't got to that part of the uh, walkthrough yet. There's so many things that they just assume you know. It always annoys me. I think that's why so many people respond well to my tutorials, is because I'm constantly annoyed by tutorials where they assume that you're going to know something or another. It would be like reading a novel where you kept running across uh, words you didn't understand. Like everything you read. Even Dr. Seuss. Actually, Dr. Seuss does have a lot of words that you won't understand. Because you make some up. That's how I prefer to go. Remembered a thing, you guys. Probably because I was saying it out loud to myself. That always helps. What's happening here? I'm getting some repetition. It's kind of making them look even more cactus like, which I am not opposed to at all. I don't want them to look exactly like a Choya, but it's okay if you evoke some of those vibes. He, is, he has a very prickly personality. So cactus is great. Great visual metaphor. Well, though, this is this is troublesome. Let's see if I have a good solution for this because I keep running into it. Um, so, tool. Can I just like squash? Uh, but I can't do that because when I do make the mold, it will have an undercut there. So, I can still minimize it. I can make it uh, look much thinner.
it's probably fine and it's it's in like a divot See what happens if I just bulk up underneath it. Does that ruin the flow of the skin? Maybe justify that extra padding with some um, skin would need to stretch around it. starting to get pretty hungry so I think it's time for the cognitive bias of the day if I can find here we go for some reason I have not saved this to a spot I can bring up yet cognitive biases boom take me to the picture okay so let's see, we just did um, something about rhyming. Oh, rhyme is reason effect. Okay, we are currently in the need to act fast main category. The simple looking options and complete information over complex ambiguous options subsection. And now we are to belief bias. So, belief. Oh, yeah. Tendency to judge the strength of arguments based on the plausibility of their conclusion rather than how strongly they support that conclusion. Oh, I'm going to need more explanation of that. The strength of arguments based on the plausibility of their conclusion. Why is that bad? Rather than how strongly they support the conclusion. I'm going to need an example, please. A person is more likely to accept arguments that support a conclusion that aligns with our values, beliefs, and prior knowledge while rejecting counterarguments to the conclusion. That's just, that's, belief bias is an extremely common and therefore significant form of error. We can easily be blinded by our beliefs and reach wrong conclusion. Belief bias has been found to influence various reasoning tasks, including conditional reasoning, relation reasoning, and transitive reasoning. Okay, I don't understand how this is any different than confirmation bias. Uh, syllogisms. A syllogism is a kind of logical argument. Yes, yes, yes. You know all that. All humans are mortal. That's the major prime premise. Socrates is human. Minor premise. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Conclusion. An example of an invalid syllogism is all teenage girls are ambitious, teenage girls study hard, therefore girls study hard because they are ambitious. Okay, I understand all that. Typically, a majority of test subjects in studies incorrectly identify this syllogism as one in which the conclusion follows from the premises. Well, that's just not understanding how syllogisms work, though might be true in the real world that a girls study and b this is because they are ambitious however this argument is a fallacy because the conclusion is not supported by its premises yes the validity of an argument is different from the truth of its conclusions understood there are valid arguments or false conclusions and invalid arguments with true conclusions hence it's an error to judge the validity of an argument from the plausibility of its conclusion I don't 
think this counts as a bias. I think this is simply not understanding how syllogisms work. That's that's just ignorance of a particular like mechanical theory of logic. It's not Okay, well, I'm too hungry to debate this with myself right now. So we're just going to have to let that one slide. There are plenty of cool ones. We'll get to the cool ones at some point. I melted your brain. That was the point. I was just thinking to myself, how can I melt Alitha's brain? The, the classic example of the of the invalid syllogism is, um, or, or sorry, the way that a syllogism or a logic, uh, a logical argument can be sound is um, all heavenly bodies are made of cheese. Uh, the moon is a heavenly body. Therefore, uh, the moon is made of cheese, right? Like that is a sound argument. Um, and that's how you tell the difference between arguments being sound and actual reality, because um, an argument can be sound if, even if the premises are false. There, there has to be a difference between those, those two things. And so things get muddy if you don't understand how syllogisms and logic works. Um, is that different than what they're calling belief bias, though? That's what I'm not sure about. It's plausible that a girl who studies hard is doing it because she's ambitious. But to me, that's no more or less plausible than because she has strict parents or, you know, uh, in the case of my first marriage, uh, Stacy had to take a bunch of summer classes to complete co uh, high school in time, you know, that year so that we could get married. So there's like, there's all sorts of reasons you can have for studying hard, and I don't know why one explanation is more plausible than another in that instance. Maybe if they used a different, a different example, I would understand it better. That's true, Leaf. All we need to melt your brain is a 10 cent word. You don't even need a 30 cent word or a 50 cent word. But actually, um, what's awesome about your feedback in particular, one of many things, is that I know you're a bright person. And so when you say you don't know what a word means, I don't just write it off as being like, all right, well, it's that person's a dummy anyway, so what do I care? Like, I'm not writing for dummies. Like, I'm writing for you and your people, Aletha. For bright, young, creative minds. Um, uh, you don't have to have learned all the words in the world to qualify for that. Transix says, is Blender a good software to start in the 3D world? Um, probably. Its interface is very different than the expensive packages that are used in film, television, and video games. So you're going to run into a learning curve if, if, you're, if you're trying to get a job, you know, it'd be great to start with what is actually industry standard however you're going to get a lot of the, the basic concepts of you know what a polygon is what normals are how to manipulate vertices what an edge loop is like there's all that kind of technical stuff that you're gonna pick up in blender just fine uh, you're just gonna have to, to get, 
build new muscle memory once you get an actual job in the industry. Most likely. I, I'm sure some places use Blender. I just, I don't know what those places are. Uh, but I mean, you can't beat the price, right? Like, uh, me and my son are both learning Blender right now uh, because I want to do indie games and I can't afford the, you know, I could totally use a cracked version of Maya or, you know, whatever to do the stuff, but I just, I don't want to run my business that way. I want to be totally above board and legit. So it's forcing me to have to learn another program to do that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah. And Blender is, uh, man, they do some really impressive stuff with it. Like, some very close to, uh, you know, Hollywood level graphics and special effects and stuff. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's used in television a lot more um, than in movies. I don't know a ton about uh, television special effects. I have a lot of friends who have done special effects for movies, um, but I don't know, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head that I know personally that has worked in TV special effects. So, yeah, I, I could be totally wrong about thinking that, you know, you can't, you're not likely to get a job using Blender. Could be totally wrong. Letha says, most of them I knew, I just felt they interfered with the flow of the story. Oh, okay, you knew the words, but they seemed out of place for, for what they were intended to accomplish. Like, just needlessly big, it seems like. I think another, actually, you know, I, I brought up indie games, uh, back to Transic is a good day. Um, the, the indie game scene, I'm sure uses a lot of Blender. Because certainly for game assets, like, you do not need Maya, uh, or 3D Studio Max, um, for indie game dev stuff, unless you're, you know, you know, I want to say even even if you're doing like really high res stuff, even then, Blender will do the trick. I mean, most of the sculpting you're gonna do is is probably gonna be in ZBrush, like I'm doing now. Um, well, Blender claims to have a sculpting system. I have not tried it myself. I've seen a video or two on it, and I'm I'm not convinced that they. Uh, are as feature rich as ZBrush, which is just the industry standard by a million miles. Like speed bumps in the sentences. I got dinged for that a long time ago in a critique group. Yeah, that's a real good point. Uh, this new focus on flow that I'm picking up on, um, I did not have a word for that. You know, when I, when I was reading, I didn't know how to give feedback to Rose and say, I, there's something like, there's something stilted or weird about this, but I don't know what it is. I don't know how to say it. And uh, a friend of mine introduced me to the concept of of flow, which, which is interesting because um, I'm very familiar with it from game design and level layout perspective. I, flow is something I'm always thinking of in the world of video games. It, uh, it really should have been a lot easier for me to pick up on in writing, but um, yeah, I needed help with it. 
before I could articulate it, so... Actually, while I'm thinking about it, uh, before I wrap for the night, I want to bring up, uh, not here, I want to bring up somewhere. Here we go. Story development? Is that where I put it? Here we go. Yeah, so these are the notes that I took for myself for the action scenes that I want to be revising. So number one is focus on emotions. Um, and by that, or one, one way to accomplish that is to define a mood arc for each character and use verbs and adjectives to highlight their emotional state throughout the arc. So, getting into a fight, you feel very different than during the fight, you feel very different than after the fight. Or stunt, whatever it is that you have to do. Uh, minimize mood descriptions. Substitute with tactical or strategic thinking behind the moves. Um, Note distance from opponent and why that decision was made. This was just like a particular idea. Being close lessen, lessens impact but subtracts reaction time. Um, alternately use poetic names for the moves to evoke rather than describe. Create tension through the necessity to sacrifice something in order to win. Um, I don't know that that's universally applicable, but maybe it is. Uh, if a fight is easy, it should be incredibly short, as its only purpose is to display protagonist martial skill. Uh, minimize terrain description. <laughs> this is this is my biggest my biggest weakness because. For the past 20 years, I've been focusing on terrain description in video games. That's what I do, is I, is I make beautiful environments. And that's like, that's a strong point of mine. I've had lots of practice with it, and then I just, I want to ex describe it all. Uh, do I want to see a super cute pic of pumpkin? Uh, hmm. I feel like I've seen about one trillion super cute pictures of pumpkin, but I will, I will um, make an exception here. There's pumpkin, uh, never looking quite so pumpkiny. That's that's a super pumpkiny cat right there. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, okay, so this was a specific note I had for myself. There's a river fight with Lilk, and I could focus on using Rage Against Her, and now Bomark learns to use it on the, the, his, like, main rival at the end of the book. And so he could, like, actually take something away from that action scene so it serves a better purpose than just being an action scene. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to read over that to give myself more reminders before I do some more work on that tonight. Can you email me that list? Yeah, sure. Uh... 
Are you uh, the rogue squirrel at Hotmail or the sparrow child at Gmail? Which is your current one? Sigrid has two cats and a dog. Sounds like a crazy animal house. This is my cute picture of, of my cat. This is uh, Princess Carolyn, and she likes to say, ah, fish. Yeah, Aletha, definitely uh, check those out, and when you see me contradicting my own rules, you can feel free to call them out. Not that, not that you weren't free to call out your own rules as well. Okay, yeah, I think I'm going to call it for tonight. I am nice and hot from not having the AC on and getting super starving. Save this puppy. And da, 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 Princess Carolyn looks like an easy maintenance pet. Yeah, actually. I mean, she practically takes care of Bojack Horseman, so you could say that she is actually the re like a reverse pet. Like she takes care of her owners, although I guess Bojack is not her owner, but she's his manager. Here's Sigrid cats, so proud and tall on their stand. Cool, man. All right, all right. Um, am I am I actually done now? Did I did I do it? Did I finish? Um, I lost my stream. I accidentally closed my stream. Well, I didn't close my my sending of the stream. I just closed my viewing of the stream, which has my comments. Oh, now the comments are gone. I can't click on your pictures. Oh, well. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it a night. Hopefully, hopefully we'll have our point system set up and working next time. We'll see. You never know. Stranger things have happened. Yes, way to derail my stream with cats. It's all right. I expect no less. All right. I will uh, call it a night and see you guys on Sunday, Sunday, Sunday.